Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Rotor World Football Show. I am Patrick Darty, joined today by Denny Carter and a special guest, Rich Rebar, our former coworker who, well, yeah, we shouldn't be talking to. Um, you're still, an, you're an enemy still for leaving. Uh, but no, is Rich is true? here. Yeah, no, Rich is one of our favorite people in the industry. We want to pick his brain on a variety of things, including an article you published recently on which running back stats matter. I want to ask you some boilerplate summer questions. Your most undervalued player in summer drafts, your most overvalued player, uh, some favorite late round targets, that kind of stuff that, again, boilerplate topics, but a lot of really interesting answers, launching point for some good discussions. Going to hit on some news, the Jonathan Taylor trade smoke, Jerry Judy being carded with a hamstring injury one day after I drafted him in my home league. Uh, <laughs> that's great. Uh, Corey Davis retiring. That was kind of a weird one. It yeah, well, really was. <laughs> And, of course, uh, the topic Rich said right before the show began, he could not talk about uh, <laughs> Trey Lance, Denny. Still, we have always talked about Trey Lance, now the number three quarterback in San Francisco. Kyle Shanahan, I think, say what you will about this. Uh, Kyle Shanahan just played it perfectly the whole time. <laughs> the whole three years with Trey Lance is just one master stroke after another from Kyle Shanahan. Am I right, Denny? Oh yeah, I mean, he knew that this was this was always going to be, um, you know, the the end game was. This is why to they draft. took him at number three, right? It w and it was to replace him with a guy who otherwise might be selling insurance. Uh, <laughs> Come on, man! And, and, <laughs> what kind? And, of, what kind of insurance? At least like really high end insurance. Yeah, right? no, I mean like the the really like fancy kind that. that People buy when they when they buy a house like right like on top of the ocean, you know, like, like in the ocean. <laughs> that kind of insurance. Kind of anyway, insurance. yeah, I mean th this this was this was never going to work. It was so so clear. It was super clear that Trey Lance was not going to work in this system, uh, or I you know I don't know if he would have worked any anywhere, system. Yeah, but 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 he but he it couldn't work in San Francisco because the 49ers quarterback or Kyle Shanahan's quarterback is asked to do as little as possible. And Trey Lance is not that kind of quarterback. He's not that kind of quarterback. Rich, uh, are you truly out of words on Trey Lance? Or do you, do you have any I mean, uh, it, I, I think it's been clear for some time that Trey Lance was not going to start this year. Uh, so why he was such like, a, you know, why we keep have to re rehash like all these takes on Trey yeah. Lance. I do think it is interesting, the overall, like, I would love to, to know exactly how this pick went down, like a detailed action. So just, how did this happen? Because it wasn't just the 49. How did the NFL – The whole trade, everything. Talk itself into Trey Lance being – like I, the whole thing never made I don't know. Because the, the loss of capital, you basically have a quarterback on a rookie contract, which is literally coveted by every team like in the NFL right now. Uh, the the opportunity it provides you. I mean, he, he's made twenty eight million dollars. I think I saw uh, you know to basically not play. Uh, yeah, and it's just worse. and you gave up the three the three draft picks. It's I would love to just go back and, and get the, the 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 tale of exactly how this all went down uh, in a thirty for thirty in some yeah. kind of. And there were a lot of people who like first guessed it. I was amongst the first guessers. Like I don't know about the guy from North Dakota State. Who's one game the previous season was like an exhibition game. One. It was one, one game. It was an exhibition game. He's thrown 420 passes since high school in actual games. Yes. That's uh, insane. Which is wild. That's what Kirk Cousins threw that in week 16 last yeah, year. Yeah, basically. Like pretty much. No, I mean, I mean, there are real, there are stats like um, uh, Dorian Thompson Robinson. Yes, I saw that. Uh, too. Yeah, has, uh, I think, I think Sam Monson from PFF pointed out that uh dtr has has dropped back more in like, like 1500 times yeah yeah if it, yeah uh uh over the over the past two or three years whatever it was anyway it's it's crazy how little trey lance has played in high school even yes he didn't even play in high i school. never looked into that one more about why he didn't even get quarterback reps in high school what we, was the story we, on that <laughs> we have to go back to to what i don't know middle school to be like oh hey well, trey lance at 12 years old he played he played a lot of flag football reps I, need to I do think that. it is interesting. I think the more interesting conversation with the 49ers is, you know, what we expect from, from Brock Purdy, though, because we had such a limited sample and we've seen so many guys in this system really kind of have a lot of like intermediate or short success against like team because he didn't play anybody in those five games. 
He, no. he faced one team the, in, in his entire sample last year that was better than 15th in pass rush. And and, it, and it's I don't think it's any coincidence he looked pretty mortal in that game, the Cowboys game, right? Because the whole reason why I have to believe that they pushed Trey Lance on Shanahan, if it was pushed on him or he even came around. There's no that, way it was pushed on him is another thing. I just have to. I don't know, they, but listen. There's but, literally but no way, way in hell. The, that the reason they happen. got to the point of adding Trey Lance, though, is because Shanahan's never had like any type of dynamic player at that position and anytime a 49ers quarterback or any quarterback in the system period that Shanahan's had if you're going to go to like the Brian Hoyer or whatever like anytime they've been tasked to punch up versus competition or when like the play out of structure and have to like the quarterback has to do something on his own it's been like a detriment no matter what guy it's been Nick Mullins Jimmy Garoppolo Brian Hoyer and like that's what kind of got them to this point and is Brock Hurdy just an extension of that he is, is he just another extension of the Garoppolo tree, right? Well, yeah. That when the 49ers have to win one of these games where they need their quarterback to actually do something on his own, is Brock Purdy that guy? It's still a question, right? So I know I made I know I made that joke uh, earlier, and I, I just love to make jokes like that. So, but I will say that Brock Purdy is way, way more is way better at improvising than Jimmy Garoppolo. J- Jimmy Garoppolo is worse that in the league, Jimmy G is the worst worst I've ever seen at improvising. <laughs> if the play doesn't go off exactly according to plan. Do you think it it's cannot, because it, he's that handsome? Work. Do you think it's because he's handsome? Yeah, it doesn't matter. I, I, I mean, I tend to think, I tend to think, <laughs> stick with me here. Well, they I always say attractive think, people are bad in bed because they're, they're it's for granted. Is Garoppolo under that same? <laughs> exactly. He's too, he actually is too good looking to be good at football. Um, he, he has practice. never had... He's never had to have that dog in him, no. right? Because he's just been given everything because he's so damn handsome. And he is he's incredibly the, handsome. The Trey Lance pick was an acknowledgement from Kyle Shanahan and what Reeves hinted at there were he's absolutely ta- he's taken a scheme to the absolute limit. And the absolute limit is almost winning a Super Bowl mm-hmm. with Jimmy Garoppolo, but he maxed the scheme out a hundred percent. Even he acknowledged they needed a player who could actually create offense on his own and have it spoon fed to him. Yeah, he's made the worst ever possible decision with the player he hitched it to. And I keep making this joke on Twitter and to Denny, but Kyle Shanahan is like the ultimate, like he needs to get rid of personnel power because the last time he did not choose his own quarterback was Matt Ryan. And then he instantly won him an MVP. Like, man, just let someone else take care yes. of this for you. Like you have horrible taste in quarterbacks. Like just let someone else figure this out and you'll be good, man. Cause no one can scheme the way you can. But, uh, My favorite part was the the Jordan Rodriguez podcast with the play callers, which was an excellent series. Was Shanahan literally talking about how he likes to gamble and he's aggressive? And I was like, Yeah, no, yeah, I know. <laughs> There's a lot of evidence um, of this. Yeah, yes, yeah, <laughs> we've all the... gotten that struck from you. So Trey Lance in San Francisco, a fiasco. You know what else would be a fiasco is not buying the Roto World Draft Guide with the NFL season quickly approaching. Now is the perfect time to get your Roto World Fantasy Football Draft Guide. Get ready for your draft and stay one step ahead of your league during the preseason with updated player rankings, profiles, projections, mock drafts, and more. Go to NBCSports.com slash draft guide and use promo code draft 2023 to save 20% off at checkout. That is NBCSports.com slash draft guide and use promo code draft 2023 to save 20% off at checkout. We update rankings in the draft guide. We will be updating rankings very powerfully guys if jonathan taylor is traded um the colts have apparently set a deadline of tuesday which is a sensible de- deadline day roster cut down day they want to know what their 53 man roster is going to look like rich first do we think jonathan taylor is going to get traded and if we do like what does a good outcome even look like and i understand if you don't have like a perfect answer for this because we're just like totally spitballing but just what do you think is going to happen with jonathan taylor and what do you want to happen with jonathan taylor I mean, I think if he gets traded, I'd be more interested in him. He's not a player I've been largely interested in outside of, you know, and I don't want to just say like any draft anyone in best ball, whatever, but outside of best ball leagues. Uh, no, because you, know, you, of, you said it. I mean, whatever. It doesn't matter. This is best ball. Because <laughs> I generally fade guys that play with rookie quarterbacks. You know, I did an article at Roto World back in 2018 that highlighted uh, player performance and the dip uh, that skill players have when they play attached to rookie quarterbacks. Now, Jonathan Taylor is a very low bar to clear to be better player than he was last year playing with Anthony Richardson. But also the ceiling upside for those players generally doesn't exist. And he's a player you're going to have to take as a, as a top 10 running back. Obviously, you don't because things are priced in and have moved that right now. But if Jonathan Taylor immediately reported the Colts camp tomorrow, he would immediately go right back to being a top 10 running back pick. So he's not generally a guy I wasn't 
looking to draft on the Colts. Uh, but if, you know, he was on a different team, that changes a lot. Uh, and it changes a lot of his projection, especially if he's on the, you know, a team like the Miami Dolphins or like the Chicago Bears or something like that. Uh, that opens things up now. We don't know until he's actually traded, but I am starting to get a little bit of uh, FOMO for not drafting him in some of these redraft leagues on the dip because of that. So I'm just going to, I got my, I'm going to wait and see kind of what happens. Uh, I will say that the, the Dolphins have given us enough, enough signals where no one should have conviction. I've seen a lot of people say like, this is just reinforcing like why people should have been taking Jeff Wilson. The Dolphins have literally given us every single signal this offseason that like they don't like their running backs. No, they're no. desperate. <laughs> they're desperate to move. So upgrade. like I, I mean, I'm not this doesn't make me want to get into the bed with anybody. Just the fact that they like Devin A. Chain has been like fifth on the depth chart, or like, you know, they didn't get Dalvin Cook. Like, they're not happy still. No. Well, but the, the Dolphins are very running back curious because apparently uh they were Curious about Josh Jacobs' availability. Yep. Now, Taylor. So, yeah, Reeves is saying that they're, they seem quite running back thirsty. But and, but I say I say that they're running back curious because if they were actually committed to getting like a, 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 a clear lead back, like an elite back in their backfield, they would have done it by now. And they're but they're not going to give Jim Irsay a first rounder. That that's not going to happen. And if that's not going to happen, then they're not they're not going to get Taylor like that. That's it's really simple. Like you, you, the, the Colts are not going to say, yes, I will take that third rounder for Jonathan Taylor. It's not going to happen. So it, it will be Jeff Wilson and, and Mostert, I think going into the season, splitting that backfield and they'll just have, they'll just have to live with it. Um, but yeah, clearly the dolphins hate their backfield options and okay. Here, stick with me for just a second. Oh boy. Um, Miles Gaskin has looked really good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that went a lot worse than I was expecting, to be honest. I'm uh, just, I just don't <laughs> think that you can, you can't write off anybody. If they don't Oof. get Taylor, if they don't get anybody else, you can't write off anybody on that depth chart right now. I think they really, really like do genuinely want a running back that it's not just being curious, but I think the, the cap situation is not great from what I remember. They had like no draft capital last year. They they had what they forfeited picks for like the Brian Flores tampering stuff. And maybe they don't want to like sell the farm again. I think I think they're missing like a third rounder this year, um, in 2024, even. And then maybe even the Dolphins are usually hyper aggressive, like feel like they can't give up any more draft capital. But would Jonathan Taylor be like would he be part of like a committee in Miami? Because like absolutely they're gonna have, not. You don't. You really. I, please tell me. That, please tell me that he wouldn't. Because I have actually absolutely not. not. Okay, absolutely thank God, not. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. I don't think there's any really anywhere. I think even like the Bears, right? Like you can be excited about Roshan and Herbert, but like if the Bears were to acquire Jonathan Taylor, dude. I mean, he, Jonathan Taylor owns that backfield. Yeah. It, it, it's a, and you know Miami is is uh, as the Zoomers would say low key uh, a, a great uh, rushing environment. Uh, it is. Was, top 10 in EPA per rush last year. Like if, if Taylor goes there, I, I would have some serious FOMO about not like Rich said, not buying the dip on Taylor. Rich, you say you want him off the Colts. Would you rather have Jonathan Taylor on the Colts or the Rams? Oh, the Rams for sure. Really? Look at what the, I mean, I mean, yeah. one, I'm, I know that it's Sean McVay, like when he's leaned in on a running back and that running back's been awesome. And we yeah, saw it yeah. even the, even last year with Baker Mayfield, like when they recalibrated like their offense when all their wide receivers died and, uh, you know, Baker Mayfield was starting. Like Cam Akers is a good fantasy back. Now imagine that. It, think of that offensive line. Everything was a disaster and Cam Akers was awesome. Like when he's settled on Gurley or even the going back and forth between Akers and Daryl Henderson. When one of those guys was the guy, like those guys produce points. I mean, I still have faith in Sean McVay like Shanahan, right? Like the Sean McVay, the play designer and play creator, like – has a, tr a tried and true track record. Also, also, I, I generally want a running back, an elite running back attached to a non-mobile quarterback. Yes. I don't yeah. know. So I don't feel horrible about Jonathan Taylor remaining on the Colts if that is the outcome. I do I mean the vibes will be quite bad. But Well, the vibe you... – go ahead. Sorry. I said I have faith in Shane Steichen. Sorry, Denny. Um, coming from the Nick Sirianni way of doing things where they're very adaptable – uh, they design really intelligent rushing attacks. Like I do think the Colts rushing offense would at least be well-designed. I do think it's oh, yeah. going to be completely tailored around the run. 
since it seems like that's going to be what the Colts do this year is they try to ease Anthony Richardson in the league. That could actually be a good thing for Jonathan. That could be a very bad thing, of course. I'm very surprised, you know, that Denny with the Miles Gaskin route instead of trying to make this about Evan Hall or somebody. <laughs> so, no, yeah. no, no. That 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 Colts backfield is going to be a mess for fantasy if Taylor's not there. It's going to be <laughs> disgusting. And yet, yeah, Zach Moss, and yeah, and yet you have him on every team. You've been I, drafting him. Stop. Since, uh, yeah. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> so no no i i yeah you're right about the the vibes will be absolutely toxic if, if taylor stays are catastrophic so yeah maybe also, for like, i mean how much do we not know about this ankle thing right like he did have ankle surgery that's like, fake i mean do we know it's 100 percent fake <laughs> no it's not it's probably not 100 percent the fake. back the ankle like that, some of, uh, something's got to be fake i mean these aren't all real look, but. look back ankle and vibes i'm skeptical yeah, it would be. I guess maybe I do want him traded. I just took him in my home league last night. Uh, I mean, do you, do you have any players that you suck that his home league? That no, we're playing yeah. Well, it's, first off, it's a it's a two quarterback league, so it was QBs early. So there's a lot of like QB desperation. So players fall. Jonathan Taylor fell to the in, very final pick of the fourth round. Oh, where we scooped wow. him up? Where we scooped That's him up? That's pretty good. Wow. Um, yeah. But yeah, we need it. We being me and my brother in law, uh, we need to know uh, if he's going to be playing football. Yeah, I will say this about John Taylor like, selecting him. I feel a lot better selecting him as my second running back than if you were to have him as your first running back. Guess who our first is, folks? It's Bijan season. It's Bijan season. So we're very, very happy about that. Um, yeah, also drafted Jerry Judy, who is was carded with a hamstring injury. Is that something that happens? <laughs> but, it doesn't uh, sound right. No, it doesn't sound right. Maybe it's just a training camp thing. Like a lot of times the cart is for pure, like purely functional right. purposes. Like they can actually walk, but you know, you're going to put a guy on a cart if he just hurt his hamstring. Uh, does this make us concerned? Because we have, who have we gotten positive vibes from Sean Payton about on the Broncos? Cool. Like every vibe has been mixed at best. Like he sends out negative vibes on a player first. And it's like, yeah, actually, you know, I kind of like him. The, and then the, they're, they're very mixed. Yeah, Denny, you take us on the Sean Payton vibes and just what, what does this mean with Jerry? Yeah, it, I, I get what you're saying. It, it seemed, it, in fact, it seemed like Sean Payton really wasn't familiar with the players on his team until no. about 30 days ago. He hadn't watched an um, AFC game since like 1995. Yeah. So Cortland Sutton, I think, has gotten enough positive press and coach comments uh, about the shape he's in, uh, about his play in 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 training camp and in, in preseason. So I, I I do think that there's there's something there. And if Judy's going to miss time. So I think Sutton, I think that that would finally push me into the camp where I'm like, OK, Sutton sounds reasonable. I'm still not like like targeting Cortland Sutton. But but yeah, I mean, he he would just be like like a, a target hog if Judy's not there. Like there's nobody else. But Jerry Judy has an actually serious hamstring injury. Like he's not going to be ready for week one. Like if, if he has the hamstring pull of like any severity, I feel like he's going to miss at least a game or two. Maybe I'm overreacting, but. Rich, what are your thoughts? Would you rather have Cortland Sutton at cost? Would you rather have Marvin Mims at cost? Well, what are you thinking in the Broncos receiver core? Uh, I've dabbled on the, the the Sutton tree, the Sutton vine this uh, offseason because he's, he's one of these guys that I wasn't into last year. He felt completely overvalued uh, and now feels like the market overcorrected itself. Like anytime we have like one of these players that gets like juiced up and yeah. then lets down, they tend to fall too far. And I think that we have a group of those guys this year, you know, like Cortland Sutton, Gabe Davis, I think Brandon Cooks, uh, uh, you know, Rotopat's favorite guy. I'm gonna bring Brandon Cooks up later, I think, because <laughs> I like to trigger Rotopat about that. But I think Sutton, I've taken him in a few leagues, by the way. The, everything's just kind of breaking Sutton's way, right? Like, well, first of all, the reports are that he has looked like explosive and fast again. Uh, then you have the Tim Patrick injury, you know, the whatever, um, you know, is going on, whatever happened to KJ Hamler with his heart issue. Everything's just kind of broken out to like where like Denver is going to kind of need him. My kind of question here with Denver overall, though, is always circles back to Russell Wilson, right? And is Sean Payton going to be the head coach that gets through to Russell Wilson that the style of football that Russell Wilson wants to play 
is no longer successful in the NFL right now. The way the current defensive meta is and how teams approach playing defense in the NFL. You know, teams are not blitzing the quarterback. They're not playing man coverage. They're they're preventing the big plays. They want to funnel throws to the middle of the field. Those are all things Russell Wilson has had no interest in his whole damn career in doing. And he didn't last year. I mean, he was one of the most aggressive vertical throwers in the NFL last year. He was one of the most aggressive throwers outside the numbers last year. And Nathaniel Hackett, it wore it all for him. And you know, I'm not defending Nathaniel Hackett. I don't think he did a good job, but Russ is really lucky that Nathaniel Hackett was attached to that team last year because a lot of these offenses, we've been doing the Russ, let Russ cook narrative for years. Every offense Russell Wilson is in looks like the Russell Wilson offense. It doesn't matter who the coordinator's been. Yeah, so is Sean Payton going to be the guy to calibrate Russ and say, listen, Russ, like we can't play this style of football anymore. It's not that successful in the NFL. We can't be on third and seven every every possession. Speak uh, for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm really curious <laughs> to see if that's kind of what happens. Because, you know, Denver is one of these teams a lot of people are like want to buy, like a bounce back in, right? Like we talked about it. The dip, has the dip gone too far? They were one of the largest disappointments of last NFL season. But are they going to provide enough like upside and enough fantasy value to make those guys really worthwhile? I think that question remains to be seen. But obviously the things are breaking the right way for Cortland Sutton to at least be like an early season factor. And with Judy, you just have to worry about like the, it's not so much him just missing like a game or two. Like when these receivers have these hamstring injuries, like the reoccurrence rate for these in season is the scary part. Shockingly high. Shockingly yeah, that's shock. the scary part is Judy comes back and you don't even play him for a week, right? Like say he misses week one, then you don't play him week two when he comes back. And then week three or four, you re-aggravate something, right? And then you're just like, well, geez, my, that, like, you're just chasing it, right, the whole season, right? Where, where would you draft Jerry Judy right now, real quick, by the way? I haven't really given it, <laughs> given it any thought. I mean, wide receiver is so nebulous when you get past, like, wide receiver 10. Like, I mean. It's <laughs> insane. Receiver is not nearly as deep this year as we've grown accustomed to. Receiver right. has been kind of receding for several years. And, like, in these home league drafts, you know, where – it's not just about where you like, you know, you're actually like building a team that you want to live with all year that you actually have to manage. And like, you know, you're really dialed in, not just in like value propositions. That's when I've been like, man, receiver is actually like, I don't know which of these guys, like I really want to have all season, you know, when they're not just like zeros and ones, when they're the guys you're going to be living and dying with all season has really like highlighted to me, like, man, receiver is not what it was like the past five or six years. What do you mean when they're not zeros and ones? Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, Denny uh, will never watch a game. He no, will never, never watch a football game. No, NBC has tried to make me, but I can't. No, but I, have yeah, not. I actually have been was stubbornly persistent, um, and you, you've been have stonewalled them for years. It okay. is actually shocking. Denny, Thanks. the portrait you give the people, you know, like sort of like, you know, sort of like a beta, sort of like, you know, like, oh, yeah, I'm just like, I'm just Mr. Denny. Uh, it's all an act. He's one of the most dogged, um, yeah. vicious attack dog kind of people you'll ever see. In a I get all my room. attorneys from Fulton County, Georgia. Yeah. Oh, come on, man. Uh, That's, is that why a certain someone can't find any? <laughs> I guess so. Uh, so Judy's going at wide receiver 23 right now. And I just think it's kind of aspirational and... This comes from someone who earlier in the preseason or the offseason, I, I wrote a lot about Judy as like a guy who I will target. I didn't think that his ADP would be in the wide receiver two zone, um, but I guess uh, I guess I was wrong. So he's going around D DJ Moore, DeAndre Hopkins, Drake London, Christian Watson. I would take any of those guys over Judy. Yeah, I think you can go like a stone's throw even further. Like what's the actual delta between Jerry Judy and like Christian Kirk versus Tyler Lockett versus Deontay Johnson, right? Like it's not that wide. They're like, you know, so like, I mean, like a lot of those guys, like I'm just going to take the healthy player basically. Makes sense. Um, real quick, does Corey Davis's retirement make – like any, like the auxiliary, ancillary, whatever word we want to use, Jets receivers more appealing. No, Michael Hardman. Like Garrett Wilson season it's just still Garrett Wilson or bust. Like, <laughs> well, now, no... now Lazard's hurt. He is. He's supposedly going to be back for week one. And, you know, but... we, we finally got there, right? Like it took us longer this offseason – uh, than in off seasons past, but we definitely checked off the box that the Randall Cobb will have a larger role than planned. Uh, off season blurb, yeah, yeah, I, no, it's, I wrote this. it's happening, it's, it's gotta happen. So, that yeah, I, mean, Devontae Parker looks great in the preseason. Oh, yeah. uh, Look, I, 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 know, tradition. I, I made you know, I think 
bringing Cobb along for the ride for the the Aaron Rodgers uh, New York tour of New York uh, was funny, okay, and 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 maybe even ir- irresponsible on the part of the Jets. Uh, and when I when I tweeted about it, xed about it, whatever, uh, Jets fan said, uh, "Hey, uh, don't get triggered over the Jets wide receiver six. That's what they're calling Randall Cobb. Now this is classic coping." Okay, NFL fan. Co- I mean, they, they have the mask on and they are sucking up that copium. <sighs> wide receiver six. <sighs> no, man, it's your wide receiver two. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah. Randall Cobb, your wide receiver two. Oh, yeah, Garrett Wilson. Please stop. First Miles Gaskin, now Randall Cobb. Wide receiver two. I, I, look, I don't I take far. no pleasure. Okay, I don't I don't like it. I, I'm but but it's it's happening. Aaron Rodgers is the GM. He's going to dictate everybody's playing time down to a snap. Okay. Randall Cobb's going to be on the field a lot. That's Danny, my one worry with the Dalvin Cook stuff, right? Like, uh, you know, because obviously we know Brees Hall is this the next unicorn, right? Or like, well, part of, you know, obviously including Bijan. But like, you know, we saw a glimpse of Brees Hall in action last year. But like, what if Aaron Rodgers just wants Dalvin Cook on the field? Like, He does. That's why they gave him $7 million. And I just can't believe half <laughs> the industry is pretending this did not happen. Or like, He's it doesn't get his matter. Way. Like it oh, matters yeah. humongously. It matters so much. It matters so much. By the way, Aaron Rodgers yesterday cited Brees Hall's miles per hour on the on the field, like, just like Robert Sala. Really they they love that. doing that, man. They they really love. But he was also like, he's a good kid. He's a good. He knows what he's doing. Oh and, man, but yeah, almost it's... like almost like uh, I didn't I didn't know I didn't know anything about this Brees kid. <laughs> or it's like he has a bright future, but that's not this year because we're that, not going to use him. Look, I, don't I, I get it. All all. All of the guy, all the people I respect the most in the industry, are in on Brees Hall, like in a in a huge way. Okay, and and so that makes me very nervous because I re- again respect, but Pat's right. I mean, if Aaron Rodgers wants Dalvin Cook lining up behind him, that's going to happen. You don't give a guy seven million dollars in August to be like the one B in a committee, and Brees Hall will have can't have success. And fantasy, at least the success that's needed for him, if he's not the one A, and Dalvin Cook is not paid to be the one B. Dalvin Cook is going to be the one A. That's if it's a committee at all. Like it's possible, Brees Hall is not even healthy enough. And I do feel like like heads are in the sand on this one. And, yeah, uh, I'm well, I would say that the beginning of the year, the Jet schedule is absolutely miserable. So even if they approach it to where they try to bring Brees Hall along, let's say there's like a ramp up period, and the offense is probably not going to look good early in the season. I mean, they op- they open up with Bills, Cowboys, Patriots, Chiefs, Broncos, and Eagles before they're by. So, like, there could be kind of like a – I don't want to say stock changes, like, coming out of the bye, but, like, if Dalvin Cook has been the 1A to that point and the offense has struggled, like, that's where you would see, like, maybe some things flip. Danny and I are about to do a best ball mock draft with Pat Crane where he will take Brees Hall, by the way. And yeah, then, that's what I mean. And like, then he's going to be talking mean? for, like, five minutes – and then I'm just gonna feel very wrong because he is yeah. gonna be very he is gonna be very right. Oh God, <laughs> he's, like he's very smart. Crane, please, please stop being in on Brees Hall. Oh, give, give me give Crane. me cover to, to not take Brees. But he's Hall. another one of those guys. That Crane, feels can like I have a loan? Taylor, where you get it if you can get him as your RB two, it's better. But if you're like one of these zero RB kind of chasing teams and you go that route, you're probably going to have not get with your results right but like if you can have like an anchor running back if you open up with like a McCaffrey a Pollard uh an Eckler or whatever Nick Chubb and then you land Brees Hall later on as your RB2 and then you just throw something else at the wall at RB3 like a short-term guy you're probably in a lot better spot with that type of build than going wide receiver heavy and then just adding Brees Hall to those rosters Danny, you have a question you want to ask Rich about preseason usage. It's a very interesting one. What is Yeah, it? yeah. Just real quick, uh, I was reading a site called Sharp Football Analysis. Uh, you may be familiar. And uh, and there was a breakdown of teams and their personnel packages uh, in the preseason so far. Now, I should tell the listeners that this doesn't necessarily dictate, this doesn't carry over automatically from preseason to regular season. I, I, I do understand that. But... Uh, I wanted to just ask you quickly about the the Ravens and Bills um, lining up very differently than than usual. We'll start with the Ravens. Um, uh, the Ravens in t- through uh, two preseason games have used eleven personnel. That's three wide receivers, 
on 64% of their offensive snaps. That's up from a league low 10% of 11 personnel in 2022 for the Ravens. Okay. Huge, huge uh, increase. Uh, and the Ravens have the NFL's number uh, highest drop back rate from 11 personnel uh, so far this preseason. So is this kind of what we've been what we've been hoping for? Like, is this confirmation that this new offense is going to do its thing and, and be way, way less run heavy? Well, we knew with like all the changes to Todd Monken, and it is unfortunate that, you know, the Ravens waited to pay their quarterback $260 million to, to go this route to finally invest in building the team entirely out of around him. Uh, but that's the, the path that they chose and they've decided to go all in this off season uh, with the addition of Todd Monk. And we know they're going to play a lot faster. They're going to be a lot more aggressive and they're going to use wide receivers. And no matter what you think about the individual wide receivers, because it's easy to kind of poke holes in like all three guys, you know, Odo Beckham's age coming off of an ACL Rashad Bateman hasn't been able to stay healthy yet. You've got a first round wide receiver that, that has not had an NFL sample, but like as a whole, this group versus what the Ravens put on the field last year at wide receiver is immensely different. You can even throw Nelson Aguilar like in there, if you know, whatever the ghost. Of he Nelson would have been Aguilar. their number one receiver for I mean, Demarcus of... Robinson was their number one. Yeah, receiver. Yeah. Nelson Aguilar, not a bit would have been the Ravens number one receiver, like after Thanksgiving last year. Yeah, no um, one of my asked. favorite stats about last season, or I guess you could say least favorite stats of last season was the final 14 games last season. Ravens wide receivers caught one touchdown pass. Yeah. Uh, like in the year of 2023, like Man. football, like you had a wide receiver on your team over 14 game sample catch one touchdown. Like that's that's just absolutely bonkers. To that think is about. mind boggling. And I like to take it a step further and, and and look at you know the personnel usage on actual passing plays, right? And so on passing plays so far this uh, preseason, the Ravens have used 11 personnel 70.4 percent of the time. Last year was 18.4%, the absolutely heinous, heinous act. But when people talk about like these, the personnel groupings, this is what wins out in the NFL eventually. Like your best players find the field and your best players find the football. I was someone, you know, and I learned this the hard way in fantasy, like coming up, uh, you know, de a decade ago now at this point, which is crazy. Uh, that, but I was someone that tried to retrofit like some of these like offensive coordinator stuff like into actual projections, right? And you find out real quick like that's very bad. It's very bad and it's very poor process when you talk about like, oh, this Kyle Shannon feeds this X receiver or Bruce Arians doesn't use his tight ends, right? Like personnel always is dictated and, and usage is always dictated by talent that you have available to you. Uh, you find that out very quickly when you go down that path, right, of, of actual prognostication. You still see a lot of people are like, we're still guilty of it as an industry uh, where people try to retrofit a lot of stuff that coordinators do uh, to the actual personnel they have now. And that, that's telling you right now, that's that's very rough. It's very rough, slippery slope to be on. So I'm curious to see if like the Ravens do get like Isaiah Likely mixed in more. Uh, and maybe we see a little bit of this 11 personnel use, especially early in the season, because it looks like Bateman, even though he's been practicing, probably won't be like a hundred percent snap player early on the season. I imagine there's going to be some load management with Odell as well. So I'm really curious to see if like, we do see like likely get kind of mixed in early in the year as like, they kind of find like their footing, uh, you know, along the way here of like these guys being healthy, like Zay flowers being ramped up, Odell being ramped up, Bateman being ramped up. Uh, Zay Flyer strikes me as a guy who is just going to be on the field a lot. He, he, he's, I don't think he's going to rely on those three receiver sets. This is something I've seen in sort of the analysis of the Ravens offense. Like, oh, well, Zay Flowers will, will get, in, get in there on the three wide receiver. No, he's going to be in a lot more than that, I think. Um, just real quick to shift over to the Bills uh, uh, preseason personnel usage. Uh, through their two, two games, Buffalo has used 12 personnel so two two tight ends um at a 35 percent rate on early downs uh they used two tight ends last year on at at a six percent rate that was the lowest in the league obviously this is related uh to dalton kincaid to wanting to get him out there uh do you think that this even though you know they're probably not going to lead the league in two tight end sets uh, do you think that this carries over? And and what does it say about Dalton Kincaid, who's going like tight end nine, ten right now? 
Yeah, similar thing. Like I said, personnel is going to dictate, and that you know, I have to imagine that when you look at it from a top-down stance, Dalton Kincaid is one of the Bills' best offensive players, even as a rookie. So he's going to get on the field. It's what's really going to be interesting to see is is how good the Bills can run out of this twelve personnel with Kincaid basically being a wide receiver, like the Chiefs have done right in, in years past. Like the Chiefs, you know, are a team that. Like last year, especially with the trade of Tyree Kill, they are, you know, one of the highest drop back teams in the league, but they don't run a lot of 11 personnel because their actual 12 personnel is 11 personnel. That's what the Bills, I think, are looking for here with Dalton Kincaid. Now that in the preseason, they have used three wide receivers on 80% of their passing plays, which is actually higher than it was last year, which is kind of interesting. But they haven't had Dawson Knox hasn't played uh, in, in both preseason games. So we haven't really seen that. Uh, play out but yeah that's what the bills clearly want to do but i go back to them running the ball because defenses are going to approach the bills when they come out in 12 personnel are they going to have to respect it are they going to treat it like this is just an actual like a tight end playing wide receiver and you would rather have in most cases an actual wide receiver playing wide receiver uh granted you have those uh situations like you have with the chiefs and kelsey but are we going to put that on dalton kincaid as a rookie right that he's travis kelsey uh and that's kind of where i say like if the bills can have offensive flexibility here and they're able to run the football out of this 12 personnel with dalton kincaid split out then that opens up a world of possibilities but if they're unsuccessful and teams can kind of say like all right well, we're going to defend this like it's just them not playing a wide receiver and they can't run the football. We don't have to respect this 12 personnel. Then it could be kind of like a bugaboo and a hindrance, but like that's all stuff we'll see like early on the season play out. But from a top down stance, again, personnel dictates what you do. And Dalton Cade on paper is one of the bill's best offensive players. Brad, if I could, if I could just take one moment quickly to totally capitulate on Dalton Kincaid. Yep. Yep. You're screwed. I, I look, I was wrong. I, I liked the jokes about Dalton Kincaid, about he's a weapon and he had one good college game. Those were fun jokes to tell. I pre- I like those, as you guys know. Uh, but I was wrong, and Dalton Kincaid's going to be on the field a lot, and he's going to make me look real dumb. So there you go. I have another like extension to Dalton Kincaid, too. So I wrote about this on the site because I do like a top-down – like trends for every position. And I don't think like a lot of people realize it because last year, Travis Kelsey just dominated the fantasy position, but like tight end usage was way up across the NFL last year. Mm. Uh, especially when you look at like compared to like the past decade of the NFL. And that inherently makes sense because of some of the things we talked about with Russell Wilson, like teams are leave the middle of the field is more accessible. The defenses want to yes. make it more accessible. Right. But there was so many injuries at tight end last year that it created just this perfect storm for Kelsey to just dominate the field. I mean, Kittle uh, missed multiple games. uh, Goddard, Waller, Kyle Pitts, Dalton Schultz, David Njoku all missed multiple games. Andrews got hurt like early in the season, was never the same player at one point. But I also think when you pair that with like some of these rookies, because everyone always says like you can't draft rookie tight ends, right? But look at the, the the past couple of years. Kyle Pitts had a thousand yards as a rookie. When Greg Dulcich and Chica Conquo got to play last year, they were effective players. I think with the current defensive meta and the fact that this was probably one of the better top talent draft classes for tight ends, like in the, the guys like Kincaid and Musgrave and Laporta, like I don't know if this is your traditional like a fade rookie tight end season because I think that these guys structurally are going to be on the field a lot and the current defensive meta gives them an opportunity to actually contribute uh, for fantasy this year. So I think there is some kind of value, especially in these best ball leagues easily where you can get like two or three of these guys together. Where, throw, where throw it just doesn't them. matter. I mean, yeah. And, but like, <laughs> I, I think we're going to see some hits here. I was trying to say best balls, just not real fantasy. And you can just like treat it like a, a meaningless game where there's no difference between good and bad things, but that actually is not true. And uh, Pat Rain is going to be drafting Sam Laporta when we link up with him here in a little bit. Um, I like me Sam Laporta. We'll, we'll be we right do. back. We do like Sam Laporta. We will be right back after this. There is no better way to start your day than watching one of the biggest stars in baseball and America's biggest city, Shohei Otani, we hope, and his Angel teammates take on the Mets at City Field this Sunday on MLB leadoff. Catch the action live at 11.30 a.m. Eastern, exclusively on Peacock. Again, Shohei Otani, we hope your elbow is feeling well enough to hit on Sunday. And don't forget, find all your favorite NBC Sports shows on Amazon Music. Just head to Amazon.com slash NBC Sports. Rich, which running back stats matter and why is it still touches? <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, I don't know if you knew this, but uh, to score fantasy points, you have to have the football. 
Um, yep. Touches seems like a very, very good place to start with running back still. You did an article on the topic, and yet you found that touches are still paramount. Maybe a quick word or two on that, but then what else matters when we're looking and what? Because there's so many stats now we can focus on with running back. Where do you? Yeah, focus? so I mean, th- this article is free on the site, so like we don't have to like like you anyone can go read this. So it's just I did do a positional series where it's like what stats matter, and I I first look at like a per game basis, like so like what if you're like a DFS player, or you're setting a lineup, like the things that matter the most for like correlation to per game, like in game scoring, and then I did like the the yearly roll rollover stuff, like which stats are the stickiest, you know, year over year. Uh, so this is on there. So I did the running back per game stuff and obviously opportunity matters the most. Uh, and then when you look at like the stuff that like is the stickiest year over year, you're looking at like per game stats uh, versus efficiency. And that's like stuff like when you think about it, like, cause we are right now looking at everything from like a, a last season as a whole. And this season is forward as a whole. And it's easy to say, like, well, this guy isn't good. Like, why would he do that? Like, why would we want, like, a not good player? Like, say, like, Alexander Madison or Rashad White are, like, the two guys that stand out, right? Like, these guys aren't good players, but clearly have, like, all this opportunity in front of them. And it's, like, kind of, like, showcases a lot of, like, yeah, well, this is why we can't always get into bed with, like, prior efficiency, good or bad, right? Um, and some things that kind of stand out, you know, in that in that kind of mold there. But, like, it's a free article, uh, I know we went long winded on Miles Gaskin and, and Evan Hall. So like, if we want to just like kind of direct everyone over there, like definitely go check it out. It, it, I looked at like 30 different running back metrics and, and highlighted like the, the significance of all of them. Uh, it's really worth reading and a classic Rich Rebar article and yes, perfect time of year to read it as home league drafts are finally really getting going, which speaking of which, so we spent the entire off season, six months establishing ADPs and best ball leagues. Um, there was a little different, than home leagues so that's like a bit of a caveat but just going in to like draft crunch time it's such a broad question who would you say is the most undervalued player in drafts right now this summer is late august august 24th right now just when i say undervalued player there's a lot of undervalued players but who, who's the first guy who comes to mind for you i mean not to trigger you but it's brandon cooks <laughs> I mean, uh, the fact that Brandon ninth Cooks year in a row, been, Brandon Cooks has been the most undervalued player. The fact football. that Brandon Cooks is the same ADP as Elijah Moore is like absolutely mind blowing to me. Yeah, like that's absolutely true. mind blowing. Uh, I mean, it's because everyone's like me, yeah, and they just don't want like the the. He has no floor. He has no ceiling. He just has Brandon Cooks. He has eleven hundred mm-hmm. yards and six touchdowns, and you might not like it, but that is peak wide receiver three performance. Yeah, I mean, but also you think anytime we've seen Brandon Cooks play with like actually like optimal quarterback play, he's been he's actually been a, a step Quite above good. that. Yeah, he's actually been a step above that. So talking about Drew Brees and Peyton Manning over the course of his career, and now he's playing with Dak Prescott, and he's also been a reliable player with bad quarterback play, like you highlighted. And one of the things that still drives me crazy about fantasy football is we don't talk about wide receiver contingency value. We talk about running back handcuffs a lot, right? Like what would happen for this running back under the zero RB realm uh, if there, this guy would get hurt. But like, how come we don't put that into any type of like wide receiver pricing? If anything were to happen to CD lamb, like Brandon cooks is going to absolutely go bonkers, dude. Like even if it's like a four or three week span, right? Like CD lamb misses two to three games. Like that is going to push Brandon cooks to basically being like a fringe wide receiver one. And like, and like we never talk about this with wide receivers, but like you can always get a lot of these guys at wide receiver that don't have continue. We're seeing a little bit with one we talked about, Cortland Sutton, right? Look at Cortland Sutton splits with with, with Jerry Judy on and off the field last year. Yes. They're night and day. Look at what uh, people are now are doing with the the uh, the property you now with uh, T- Terry McLaurin having this toe injury and Jahan Dotson getting a spike. Right? How come we don't initially price this in? Right. Like Gabe Davis, they, like what happened if something happens to Stefan Diggs? Like, well, I don't even know who who would that be with Gabe Davis. It can't be Gabe Davis. It has to be by default, right? But like, how, sure come, how come we don't do this? Uh, Jordan Addison right now is yes. being he's wide receiver thirty eight. If Justin Jefferson were to miss a month, like, that, that's what I was thinking it, immediately when you said contingency for receivers. I thought. Addison will be like an elite fantasy option if Jefferson misses time. But the point with Cooks though is that he doesn't even need contingency value. His because his real his standalone no, right. value is quite. Well, I'm right. saying it's still not priced in either. Like he's all these outs to where he is undervalued. Is what I'm saying. He's like the oh. wide receiver 43 and underdog. The wide receiver 40 and like more normal formats and the odds he finishes outside the top 36 are 
like minuscule. I do. So my point, sorry, Denny. My gripe always with Brandon Cooks is that he always yeah. like barely overperforms ADP. The this Robert year, Roy I think it's going to be by ten to twelve spots. A lot of years is like by one to two spots. I'm like, yeah, wow, great, cool. I, I uh, will say that that uh, the I don't know stench of Mike McCarthy. Sorry, Mike, if you're listening. Uh, it, it you know makes me hesitate to draft Cowboys outside of the Lamb Pollard tier, right? Um, and even I'm not super high on Pollard. But as you so. pointed out, Denny, Mike McCarthy is like a fake run game. Exactly. Guy. Right, right, right. So, so I just I and you know if if he you know continues with his history of very a very pass heavy game plan, that's great for a guy like Cooks. And look at their roster. This is again where it it so. Take you take the comments right like earlier in the offseason, like people got all crazy of like the Cowboys want to maybe run the football more than people think. But look at the Cowboys roster. It's like this is made to be an 11 personnel team. Their starting running back is a guy that's probably not going to push the 350 touch mark, right? Like he probably will barely even if he crests 300, uh, be right around that area. Um, and none of the depth guys are high touch guys. Like who, who in the, the, the depth running back depth are we going to like throw value at? Right. Malik Davis, Rico Dowdle, Deuce Vaughn. And then you remove Dalton Schultz. We've got kind of like a, a lot of young tight ends. None of them are, are going to have the targets, the earn the targets that Dalton Schultz had. And then you get Michael Gallup back a uh, second year removed from ACL. Like this team is built to throw the football. Like it actually is structurally built to throw the football, like a lot more than people want to say. Because like you're not going to line up and get some of those people, Powell including the the head coach of the team, right? Yeah. And like I said, when even as someone who's gone back and like you, you try to project some of the stuff to what the coaches want to say, like I'm telling you right now, if you go back and look at like the history, the things that went out are the best players, right? Like your best personnel package is going to weed itself out throughout the season. And I firmly believe when you look at the Cowboys, like their 11 personnel is by far like their best unit. So Brandon Cooks is the most undervalued player in fantasy for the ninth straight season. Rich Rebar, when I say overvalued player, we know there's many overvalued players. But who is the first person that comes to mind when I say overvalued in summer 2023 fantasy drafts? I want to give you guys actually a spicy player since I did a super lame Brandon Cooks. <laughs> I only really wanted to do it because of Roto Pad. I like just, just <laughs> if it's like true, catnip. I just I am triggered. Yeah. But uh, I, I think it's a, a guy that I really just haven't drafted, uh, and I want to pick a player at the top of the drafts is, is Chris Olave, man. Um, and it's a, a, clearly a very good player, uh, an ascending player. But I think about where he goes in drafts and his surrounding wide receivers, and like. He's going around guys that are going to maybe have 30 to 50 more targets than him on the season. And I, I it's really hard for me when you look at Chris Olave last year, uh, weeks 8 through 18, he was a top 20 scorer just two of his final nine games. He topped 71 yards in just one of those games. Uh, and this is a team structured thing, not an Olave thing, that I have the biggest problem with him getting the volume. Uh, from weeks 8 through 18 last season, that stretch I talked about, the Saints were dead last the NFL in plays run. They were 27th in drop back rate. They have Chris Lava only ran 30 pass routes in one of those games. One of them. Uh, they have one of the easiest projected schedules this season. They signed a running back in free agency. They drafted a running back in the second round. Like this is a team that wants to play boring football, like absolutely boring football if they are allowed to. And if the schedule uh, that the Saints have uh, placed before them allows them to play boring football, I think they're going to take that and do th- and just play boring ass football. So, like when you talk about him going around guys like Jalen Waddle, right? Like Jalen Waddle could have he could have forty more targets than Chris Olave. Like it's just really hard for me. Like I I really like the player, but like I just don't think where he's being drafted, he has like the requisite target count ceiling. Like he's gonna have to be like hyper efficient, I think, yeah. to pay off where he well, goes. And you didn't even mention that I mean we have the return of one of the greatest compilers in NFL history, at least for three or four games with Michael Thomas. <laughs> and he does have a guy vying with him for like the big play specialty, Rashid Shahid, who was like hyper shockingly efficient as a rookie. That will probably fade on greater volume, of course, but that I mean, you don't think that that was this high at Andy Dalton ball last year? Not that they're going to want to be like uh, getting Derek Carr out in the world, like like he's one of the best passers of his generation or whatever. But you don't think that maybe that was just about hiding Andy Dalton and Jameis Winston last year, Rich? I mean, there's probably an element to it, but when you look at, I mean, they if they're winning games, right? All the signals here, like I said, they look at what they've done this off season. Like look what they've done to this roster, right? Like. 
what they've it, done to our beautiful boys. And you <laughs> talk about where he goes in ADP, not even at the wide receiver position, but he goes next to Tony oh, Pollard. Man. You know, he goes next to Derek. You Pollard. know what is, is really weird about Chris Olave is I feel like I'm not hearing any takes about Chris Olave. I'm not hearing any like pound the table takes for Chris Olave. I hadn't heard anything negative about Chris Olave to now. He's yeah. been like an autopilot player all summer uh, where he's just not getting discussed much. I just don't think when you look at the players at, at not even removing wide receiver, the players he goes around at other positions just offer so many pipelines to higher ceilings. Like, cause he goes right where the quarterbacks start to go off the board, right? Obviously the hurts Allen Mahomes is he's going off where I said, like Pollard is coming off the board at running back. Derek Henry is coming off the board at running back. Mark Andrews is still available at tight end. Like these are players that just, I think have, have higher positional apexes the, to make like positional leverage matter more than he will it's a really really interesting way to put it and just yeah i mean i had just like barely i hadn't thought about any macro chris Olave arguments almost all summer he's just not coming up much and I'm i wanted to make up for the brandon cook <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You, you're right i mean you, you look at where he's going uh you know you're i'm taking waddle over Olave. i'm taking Devonte smith over Olave. i'm probably taking t higgins over Olave. Uh, he is yeah. where it gets, begins to get really borderline. I I, I kind of wonder about what, what is our as an industry our obsession with T Higgins. He's a guy with like oh. a really really high floor, but never has really demonstrated a ceiling. Even Jamar Chase was injured last year. He feels like a really high floor, limited ceiling player to me. T Higgins. Well, yeah, I mean, but I mean, and he, he, talking about contingency, he is the ultimate contingency. But, so even with even when Jamar Chase was hurt last year, he, he, it didn't like open up like another realm for him. I did it not? Think. No, it really didn't. Actually, I don't think he really did much. Well, I mean, he probably. I think he just kept T Higginsing. Uh, there's no way to find out though. <laughs> you can't look. I, I mean, listen, I <laughs> I, 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 right I wrote now. an article that actually has the actual table of T Higgins. Uh, on don't off split. Splits, don't right? cite that. Yeah. Uh, what, Please, were they really God. were they really good? Actually, yeah, I can't they, remember. They were actually, yeah. <laughs> you yeah, no, hear no, no, them? No. Do you want to hear them for the sake I of the I actually do. Read, yes, them, read them into the record. So he he ran 155 routes last year with Jamar Chase off the field. He he averaged 2.46 yards per route run. He had 26.9% of the team targets. He was targeted on 25% of his routes. Now he ran 498 routes with Jamar Chase on the field. 1.6 yards per out run, 16.5% team target share, 18.3% target. His big per problem outrun. is that Jamar Chase is going to be on the field. Yeah, I think that's what you said though. Like the reason T. Higgins ADP is where it is, is one, he's he's got the burrow attachment, right? And you know, we do live in a stacking society where people want to get all of these guys on one team. Uh, and then also the contingency stuff is baked in, right? Like so. I, the, the I con- he is one player where the contingency stuff is baked in because yeah and where it can be baked in because his, his standalone value is so good but if jamar chase doesn't get hurt t higgins like just is not he's not like a high ceiling player yeah he's uh, like largely where i see like a big firewall at the position and we talk about the position not being as deep uh as perceived and to me he is like a big firewall guy where like i see a lot of similar players because i mean i outright like dk metcalf more than him uh um, you know, so like, and he typically goes after because he's not attached to Joe Burrow, and you know, you can build those Seahawks stacks easier too. I don't know why people just go and go that route. Because <laughs> uh, we we like we, we like explosives. We don't want Geno Smith. We want we want Burrow Ball, Rich. We want Burrow Ball. Um, DK Metcalf's a really really interesting one, by the way, because it's it certainly JS. Uh, his role seems much more JSN proof than Tyler Lockett's. But Tyler Lockett it seems like everything proof. He's like something he, – he's like an undead zombie where there's nothing you can do to come between Tyler nope. Lockett and his end-of-season numbers. So the, really the Seahawks is. receiver core has been one I've had so much trouble with this summer. And as, as a result, like again, especially in like these home-managed leagues, not best ball, you know, home-managed leagues where thing, things actually matter, um, I've just been like throwing up my hands and like ignoring, not taking a stand on the Seahawks receiver core. And that's a very cowardly way to go about things. Uh, you need to take a stand and actually have an opinion. And I don't. No, it's tough. It is tough to 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 nail down exactly, especially now with the injury. And for, and I don't want to hear about like OJ oh, saying might might miss week one. He's come on, come on. I mean, you're you're not going to be able to use him in fantasy until October. 
<laughs> yeah, they have a week five buy. They have a really yeah. early buy. Oh, so like, there's a, uh, a stance where you might not use him the opening month of the whole. This season. is the Seahawks, man. They're probably going to like slap like an actual like car part on his hand and like have him out there in week one. <laughs> he just got a, ro- a cyborg like, arm. No, there's like his fourth drop of the game. He clearly can't catch the ball, but Pete Carroll's keeping him in the game. And I don't know why. Anyone He's crying out in pain every time yeah. he, he so, touches the ball. They do a lot of really crazy stuff with injuries. But yeah, uh, hard to get around a broken hand for a wide receiver. Rich Rebar, when I say quarterback target in 2023, I know this question can be anything. Who's your favorite early? Who's your favorite late? Just when I say quarterback target in 2023, who's the first first guy that comes to mind? I mean, those are the good guys, right? Like, you know, if you can, obviously you want to, you know, play it by ear. You don't want to be the first person to take a quarterback still in your draft because you don't know when the second quarterback is going to come off. It's, it's It'd be cool to, like, totally believe that, you know, every time I take Josh Allen or Jalen Hurts or Patrick Mahomes, that immediately someone's going to follow that. But what if it is a round or two, right? It, it, you're still always at that risk. So I always want to monitor where those guys are going. Typically, they all are going to go in a little cluster. And then you're kind of looking at like that secondary group. Well, all right, well, where is Lamar or Fields going to go, right? Because we know the archetype of quarterbacks we want to have, like these guys that have the high rushing floors. And if they run into a really good passing season, they're just really hard to beat. Like it's, it's, we found, we found that out. Like the original Konami code is about guys like, you know, Tim Tebow and Taysom Hill, or even like Justin Fields last year was like a traditional Konami guy where like the rushing gets you a floor and people don't realize how valuable that is. But then we had this whole other archetype come in where like, all right, the, Hey, the athletes can pass now. And it's just blown the doors off of quarterback. Like if you don't have one of these guys like Josh Allen, that's giving you 700 rushing yards, also throwing for 35 passing touchdowns, also throwing for 4,000 yards. Like those guys are just really hard to beat. So you want to have a guy that like falls under those principles. Uh, That's why I think it makes it so tough to be aggressive with that burrow. His ADP is falling a little bit now since the calf stuff, but like the burrow Herbert Lawrence tier is a little harder to get like, fully invested in at their ADPs because there, there's a lot more fragility there than people price in. And we saw it with Herbert last year because those guys have very thin odds to actually be the QB one overall anyways, just under the umbrella of how the NFL is because they have to throw 40 passing touchdowns. Like there's no other, like they have to flirt with 40 passing touchdowns and maybe even more than that to be the QB one overall. Now those guys might have a little more safety than the guys like fields and Lamar, uh, because of their passing stuff, but like the ceilings for those players to be the actual QB one, like they just have it. It's it's higher end in their range of outcomes to actually be the QB one overall than it is for those guys, which is kind of crazy to think about. Uh, but it then is, you get, that is a really interesting and very accurate way to frame it. Um, yeah. So and then like you so if, so if I get froze out of there, like I'm typically looking to kind of say like, all right, well then all right, well where can I get Anthony Richardson, right? Uh, and then after that, then like where I'm probably gonna wait and just play like the schedule game. Like so I would I would also include Deshaun Watson and the Anthony Richardson area just because that also still exists as an outcome for Deshaun Watson because we've seen him be that type of player before. Um, Cause he fits that archetype. And then I'm looking at stuff like Geno Smith, right? Like from a value stance, if I get shut out, Jared Goff, Jared Goff, Jared Goff closed last year. People taking, don't want to talk about it. The media quite literally yeah. will not talk about and, it. Where's look, CNN? At, look at Jared Goff's opening three games. If you get froze out of quarterback, right? If you get frozen out of quarterback this year, Jared Goff opens with the chiefs potential shootout. He opens, then he plays the Seahawks. He was the QB one last year against the Seahawks in a game where he didn't even have Amon Ross St. Brown. And then he plays yeah. the Falcons in week three. So, like, you have this runway if you get froze out. Say, like, all right, well, I've got at least a three-week bridge where I can play Jared Goff and, like, not be killed. Geno Smith has a great schedule to open up the year. Some of these guys that don't, though, like, I we talked about the Jets schedule. Like, he kind of – like, Aaron Rodgers goes in that grouping. Like, their schedule is absolutely miserable to open the year. Uh, Tua, Tua's schedule is absolutely rough. And Tua was already a guy who had no good games last year against good defenses. My like QB two in my home league, by the way. Yeah. I mean, they open up with a, with like a really <laughs> tough opening month. Uh, you know, first he plays the chargers, a team that completely negated him last year. Then they play at new England, uh, Denver, and then the bills like really tough. Uh, there's an upside with Tua still too, but it's going to depend on Mike McDaniel's calibration of his offense, uh, coming into this year and what teams did to them. Uh, Daniel Jones is a guy people I know like really are into, and he does kind of fit that archetype and he does the rushing. I love, I'm going to cut you out. I just love to be into people whose career year didn't even produce a top 12 season. Sorry, Rich. Yeah, and dude, has anyone looked at the Giants' schedule? Like, has anyone like actually looked at it? Like, I actually haven't. 
Dude, their schedule is they they have our 30 ranked 32nd ranked passing schedule. The worst passing schedule by far. They open up with the and Daniel Jones, all of his good games last year, guess what they came against? Jamokes. Like he torched the Colts, he torched <laughs> the Lions. Like cool. But like Don't forget dude, the Vikings in the playoffs. Yes, yeah, the, the Vikings, yes, who like, you know, gave up 30 points to the Colts last year, like the worst offense yeah. <laughs> like that ever has ever seen. But like the, the 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 Giants open up with the Cowboys, then you get that cushy game against the Cardinals. But then you got 49ers, the Dolphins, the Bills, the Jets, the Cowboys again, the Patriots, all before like that week 13 bye. Like it's all before like Halloween. <laughs> it's it, it's a tough schedule. So I will at least have some leniency on Daniel Jones because of the rushing. But like are Daniel Jones, like are you ever gonna want to like set him in your lineup for like a ceiling performance against the 49ers, against the Cowboys, against the Bills, against the Dolphins, against the Jets? Like there's absolutely no way. Way, you're gonna you're gonna think that so like i mean it, it like I, you that's when you start when you get frozen out of like that firewall at the position you, i think you want to look at some of these early season schedules to kind of like help you uh kind of north star your way out of the position a little bit wow rich we're almost out of time we've taken a lot of your time i just want to end the show by asking you about i don't know if you could call this player the most controversial player in fantasy this year but he's very very close calvin ridley just where do you fall on Calvin Ridley? Like, is he a legit, like, high-end wide receiver two? Should he not even be being treated as a wide receiver two? A guy who hasn't really played in two years. Calvin Ridley, his opinions are all over the map. I didn't want to draft him, but I found myself drafting him a lot because of what we talked about earlier, where the receiver just isn't as deep as it has been in recent years. So I found myself a wide receiver two, if I go running back early at all, like kind of grasping for upside, and I'm like, man – like Calvin Ridley's downside is so acute, but I, I feel like no choice but to reach for his upside here. What do you think about Calvin Ridley coming into his first season with the Jaguars? Yeah, I, I find myself more on the pro side. For one, the reason, like you said, the current wide receiver meta in drafts and kind of where he's being drafted, because I think you can make the downside argument for a lot of the wide receivers he goes around. Uh, like I just did one with Chris Olave. Uh, and, you know, you talk about T. Higgins, another guy, right? Uh, we talk we, about DK we, we hit them all. They're all bad. We, all we hit them all. Like there's a there, there's a, a reason to tear down a lot of those guys. But I think there, there's two reasons why I'm on the pro side. One, I think the Jaguars are just going to throw the F out of the football this year. Their offensive line is trash. Like, I don't think they can line up and run the ball on anybody this year. Uh, so I think they're going to put the ball in their best player's hands. It was just Trevor Lawrence. And they're going to wing it. They're going to wing it around. I just don't think they're going to be able to play bully ball against anyone. I think they're in the and structurally, I think they're built to throw the football. And then two is the Trevor Lawrence factor. Like we've got pretty hard soil evidence that it's, there's no coincidence that Christian Kirk, Evan Ingram and Zay Jones all had their career years attached to one common denominator. These are guys the fantasy community threw out. We were like, these guys are nothing but busts. Um, there's no way I'm drafting Evan Ingram again. There's no way I'm drafting Christian Kirk again. Same, I don't know if anyone's ever drafting Zay Jones. Same. But like Josh Norris was drafting Zay Jones. But <laughs> I don't think that it's a coincidence that the common denominator was all these guys had their career year attached to Trevor Lawrence. Uh in so, I mean, the, the fact that I think that Trevor Lawrence is, is probably good and the fact that the Jaguars, I think, are just going to throw a lot. But I think this could be like a, a situation almost like where we saw like with the Chargers a little bit last year. Like we could be pushing, I think, like 650, 700, I, 700 pass attempts, I think, for I the Jaguars. I had a big yeah. argument with my brother-in-law oh. about whether Tua or Trevor Lawrence should be our QB2. Oof. We took tour. I, I think the Jaguars are going to throw the hell out of the football. This they year. are. They absolutely are. There's like my, zero debate. <laughs> my uh, my Lawrence isn't good. Take is going to look real bad. Yeah, he's yeah. very good. I didn't. That's one of your takes. I didn't know that. Yeah, I don't. I just what? didn't. I just I didn't see anything special. I, don't, I still don't. But I guess I guess he's good. Well, he's. Uh, I don't know if you've heard. If, this. if Evan Ingram, very, very make large. Evan Ingram good. It's, I, I hadn't. I, it's weird. Rich is a way of like. Making very simple observations that like no one else has made. Yes, like, yes. Yeah, it probably is a pretty good sign that all those guys I had left for dead were suddenly amazing last year with uh, Trevor Lawrence. Maybe should have focused on that. Maybe it was more. Doug Peterson. Can I get any buyers <laughs> it, there? It, it might have been. We'll see. We're looking into it very powerful. Um, well, Rich, we're out of time. Uh, thank you so much. Extremely good stuff. Just genuine fantasy football wisdom. Always some at Lord Reeves on Twitter. Uh, all your stuff on sharp football analysis. Like seriously, almost no one sees the game the way you do. Uh, your view is always still evolving. You don't stay static as an analyst. Nope. Uh, 
just genuinely on the Mount Rushmore of fantasy football analysts. And thank you so much for taking the time to come back and talk with Denny and I. Yeah, anytime, guys. Uh, anytime I can come get Miles Gaskin takes, I'm yeah. here for it. <laughs> and, uh, you, know, yeah. you know where to come, Rich. But th- thanks mm-hmm. for coming on. Yeah, you do. Danny's got the Miles Gaskin. You've got the Brandon. Cooks. Oh, They're I should say the uh, before the overlords come hunting for me. That, that you know, I, I we yeah, you know, I want to take away anyone from the Roto World. No, uh, no, no, no. Draft kit, but you know, I also put a draft kit together myself. And if anyone is listening and cares uh, what I, I have to say, you can use the code Sharp fifty and get fifty percent off that for the final two weeks. Well, well worth it. Amazing yep. stuff from, from Reeb's every single year and from Sharp Football Analysis. So. For Denny Carter, for Rich Rebar, I'm Patrick Darty. Thank you so much for listening. We will be back next week. Good luck in your weekend drafts.